Appendices 5 to 8 of Autobiography of a Seaman, Volume 2, by Lord Thomas Cochrane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 5. Letter from Richard Gurney, Esquire, to Lord Cochrane. King's Bench, September 9th, 1814. My Lord, in replying to your Lordship's letter of yesterday, I beg to observe that several applications have been already made to me from several quarters for the purpose of obtaining the particulars of the conversation between the Honourable Mr. Murray, another gentleman, and myself, alluded to in your letter, but that I have hitherto refused to comply with such applications for reasons which must be sufficiently obvious to every delicate and honourable mind. Being requested, however, by your Lordship to say whether your name was said to have been connected by de Beringer with the imposition which he had in contemplation, I can no longer hesitate in giving to the best of my recollection a statement of the facts relating to your lordship. A few days before the late trial against your lordship and others, I was informed by Mr. Murray that he was to be examined as a witness on the approaching trial. I asked him what was the nature of the evidence he had to give. He replied that de Beringer had some time ago told him that he, de Beringer, and Mr. Cochrane Johnson had a plan in contemplation which would be the means of putting a large sum of money into each of their pockets, that he joked de Beringer and asked him to let him into the secret of the plan, that de Beringer laughed and refused to tell him what the plan was, saying it was too good a thing to be made known. Mr. Murray added that his conversation with de Beringer took place a short time previous to the hoax on the stock exchange, and that it was imagined from a combination of circumstances that de Beringer must have had the hoax in view when he spoke of the plan between Mr. Cochrane Johnson and himself. I asked Mr. Murray if your lordship's name was mentioned by de Beringer. He replied, Oh no, nothing was said about Lord Cochrane. I observed that I was glad of this, as I conceived de Beringer would certainly have mentioned your name as well as Mr. Cochrane Johnson's, had your lordship been in the plot. Mr. Murray rejoined, Yes, I think it very probable. The morning after, Mr. Murray, in accidentally recapitulating the conversation between de Beringer and himself, remarked that upon recollection he thought your lordship's name was mentioned by de Beringer, and presently afterwards he observed that on reconsideration your lordship's name certainly was mentioned. I naturally felt surprised at this statement, it being so contradictory to that of the preceding day, and took the liberty of observing to Mr. Murray that I conceived he would act wrong, however correct his intentions might really be, to give any evidence respecting your lordship after so strangely forgetting himself as to the only part of the conversation which could affect your case. Other conversation passed, but I am not so positive and clear in my recollection of it as that which I have detailed to your lordship. I have the honour to be, etc., Richard Gurney, Jr. Reader's Note, End of Appendix 5, Appendix 6 begins. End of Reader's Note. Appendix 6 Letter from Lieutenant Prescott to Lord Cochrane, King's Bench, November 28th, 1814. My Lord, having been requested by your Lordship to commit to writing the information which I communicated to you some months ago, I have no hesitation in complying with your request. The substance of the account which I received from the persons whose names I mentioned to you, and who may be called upon if required, is that they were of the party at a dinner which was termed the Stock Exchange Dinner, provided by order of Mr. Harrison at Davies Coffee House in the bench on the day before the trial, at which dinner the Honourable Alexander Murray was also of the party, which consisted of seven or eight persons, that after they had dined and the bottle had gone briskly round, Harrison said to Mr. Murray, who was then and still is a prisoner for debt, that he would get his affairs settled, and as he should receive a large sum from the exchange for the conviction of Lord Cochrane, if he, Murray, wanted fifty pounds, he should have it to-morrow, proposing at the same time success to the stock exchange, which was drunk in claret with loud cheering. That this took place in the public coffee-room before many persons, both in the room and looking in at the windows, the dinner attracting considerable attention from its style, which was unusual in the bench. That Mr. Harrison, in answer to a remark from one of the bystanders that the dinner would cost around some, said it did not signify if it cost fifty pounds, as the stock exchange would pay for it, that when the majority of the party had drunk as much as they could or were willing to drink, Mr. Harrison ordered several full bottles to be placed on the table, and the task of finishing the wine, which remained, devolving at length to the Honourable Alexander Murray, and he being unable to accomplish it by himself, 
he went into the lobby of the prison and procured two of the turnkeys to assist him. The further account of one of the persons above alluded to, who usually messed with Mr. Murray, is that for some time previous to the trial, Harrison was daily with Mr. Murray, dining and drinking with him, and that he was present when Harrison visited Mr. Murray, accompanied by the solicitors Messrs. H. and R., on which occasion Harrison said to Mr. Murray, "'Here are the gentlemen who will accomplish your wishes.' And one of those gentlemen replied, "'Yes, Mr. Murray, after this trial of Lord Cochrane has passed, we will then attend to your liberation.'" Reader's note, footnote, Messrs. H. and R. were Harrison's solicitors on the trial between him and the Honourable B. Cochrane, and have since been employed by Mr. Murray, though they have not effected his liberation. Reader's note, footnote ends. That he heard Mr. Harrison declare in the lobby, as did many other persons, that he should receive a sum of money if he could procure evidence which would convict Lord Cochrane, intimating at the same time that he was induced to offer his services to the Stock Exchange in procuring evidence against him by his personal antipathy to the whole family of the Cochranes, which he said would never subside while he breathed, that subsequent to the trial he has repeatedly heard Mr. Murray express himself sorry for having appeared in court against Lord Cochrane, and acknowledge that he had been the dupe of Harrison, in persuading him that his solicitors would undertake the arrangement of his affairs and effect his liberation, provided he would appear as the evidence against Lord Cochrane at the trial. Reader's note, footnote. It is due to the unfortunate Mr. Murray to observe that his yielding to the arts which appear to have been practised upon him to induce him to introduce my name into the evidence he had to give at the trial is solely to be attributed to the imbecility of his mind, naturally good, occasioned by a long-continued habit of excessive drinking. Reader's note footnote ends. Shortly before the trial, I addressed two letters to your lordship on the subject of Harrison's visiting and tampering with Mr. Murray, who was expected to appear as an evidence against you. But your lordship did not answer those letters, nor attend at that time to my communications. The fact, however, was notorious in the bench. On my own knowledge, I have only to add that on the day of the Stock Exchange dinner, as it was called, my attention was attracted by the noise of the entertainment and the number of people collected, and I went into the coffee room and saw the party at the table, as did many other persons, and towards the close of the evening I saw Mr. Murray return from the lobby into the coffee-house, accompanied by one of the turnkeys. It was well known that Harrison was in a state of extreme indigence previous to the trial. Reader's note footnote. He was imprisoned for defaming Mr. Cochrane, and afterwards detained for debt in the King's Bench, where his acquaintance with Mr. Murray is supposed to have commenced. Reader's note footnote ends. But shortly afterwards I was present when he took a considerable number of bank notes out of his pocket, and saw him place a fifty-pound note in the hands of a gentleman to remain till an account with Mr. Lewis was investigated. I have also heard Harrison declare, in the presence of other persons, that he would ruin the whole Cochrane family. I am your lordship's most obedient servant, Thomas Prescott. Reader's note, end of Appendix 6. Appendix 7. Minutes furnished to Messrs. Farrar and Co., my solicitors, at the trial, at their own request, and endorsed by them, Lord Cochrane's minutes of case. Lord Cochrane was not in habits of intimacy with de Beringer. De Beringer never broke bread in Lord Cochrane's house, and never, as far as Lord Cochrane knew, sat down in it. Reader's note footnote. Neither in Green Street nor in any former residence see answer to an anonymous letter at the end of this publication. Reader's note footnote ends. Lord Cochrane's servants never carried a note or letter to de Beringer, or put any note or letter into the post for him. De Beringer's servants never bought any note or letter to Lord Cochrane, or forwarded any address to him. The only person who came to number 13 Green Street on the 21st of February in uniform, or the appearance of uniform, was de Beringer. De Beringer wore a grey greatcoat, without any trimming, and had a green coat, or a coat with a green collar, under it. Reader's note, footnote. See the second of the series of questions which I addressed to my solicitors, July 25th. Reader's note, footnote ends. De Beringer sent a note to Lord Cochrane, which was delivered to him at Mr. King's manufactory, where he was in the daily habit of going. The Honourable Major Cochrane was dangerously ill and confined to his bed at that time in Spain. Reader's note footnote at Cambo in France on the borders of Spain. Reader's note footnote ends. Lord Cochrane was appointed to command the Tonnant, but had obtained leave of absence to draw up and lodge the specification to a patent. His leave of absence was to expire on the 28th of February, and he did write such specification and lodge it on the 28th of February. 
The man who happened to open the door to de Beringer had been hired for the express purpose of going into the country to relieve Lord Cochrane's sea steward, and did so accordingly. No man whatever lived in Lord Cochrane's house except himself and one or two servants. The servants, who were discharged, had received a regular month's warning, and left in consequence thereof. On 14th of February, Lord Cochrane directed Messrs. Lance and Smallbone to purchase for him £5,000 omnium for money, Reader's note footnote, which they did on the 15th, footnote ends. But on going to the office, Reader's note footnote, on the 15th, footnote ends, with the intention to pay for it, he found that he had neglected to bring the necessary sum, and having only about £50 on him, he borrowed from Messrs. Fern, Lance, and Smallbone, a sum equal to the deficiency except £200, which was lent to his lordship by Mr. Butt. Mr. Fern was repaid the following day, Reader's note footnote, on the 17th, end footnote, by the sale of the Omnium, Lord Cochrane having given orders to sell it in the event of his not being able to come into the city, which was the case. Messrs. Lance and Smallbone repaid themselves, and Lord Cochrane returned Mr. Butt the £200, when he received the balance on Saturday the 19th. Reader's note, end of Appendix 7. Appendix 8. King's Bench, July 25th, 1814. Gentlemen, in consequence of what passed in the House of Commons on Tuesday last, I feel it my duty to call upon you as my solicitors on the late trial for answers to the following questions. Did I ever give you in writing any other instructions for the brief than a few observations contained in one sheet of paper, which was afterwards endorsed by you, minutes of case? Was not the description of de Beringer's dress as contained in those minutes, namely, a grey great coat without any trimming, and a green coat or a coat with a green collar under it, understood by you to have reference to what could be proved only, and not to imply a doubt in my mind as to the colour of the undercoat, but merely to intimate that witnesses might only be able to speak to the colour of the collar, on account of the body of the coat having been concealed by the greatcoat. Did not I, at your request, send my servants, Thomas Dewman and Mary Turpin, to your office to be examined by you, preparatory to drawing up the brief? And were you not previously in possession of my affidavit, in which the coat worn by de Beringer in my presence on the 21st of February is sworn to have been green? And were not you aware that my said servants had also made affidavits that the officer they saw at my house on that day wore a grey great coat buttoned up with a green collar underneath? Did you not particularly question them as to the colour of the undercoat? Did you not expressly ask them whether it was a red coat, and whether they could swear that it was not a red coat? which they could not because it was worn under a great coat which was buttoned up was it not in consequence of repeated questions that they were induced to admit that the undercoat might be red did either of my servants admit that any part which he or she saw of the undercoat was red did you not in consequence of the examination of my servants insert in the brief that the undercoat worn by de beringer was a red coat with a green collar did you ever call my attention to that part of the brief by word or letter and do you really believe that I was privy and consenting to the fact of my counsel being authorised by the brief to admit that coat to be red, which I uniformly declared to you was green, and which I had sworn to be green. Did you read the whole of the brief to me, or merely detached parts? Did I peruse it myself in your presence, or to your knowledge? Did you ever, previous to the trial, furnish me with a copy of it? Did I ever make any alterations in the deposition of the servants, or in any part of the brief, relative to what they could depose on the important subject of de Beringer's dress. Did I ever desire you to re-examine them on that point? Did I ever, as far as you know and believe, give instructions to my counsel? Did I ever attend any consultation? Was not my defence mixed with Mr. Johnston's contrary to my orders? And did you inform me that Mr. Johnston's counsel, and not my own, was to plead my case? Was I not as far as you know and believe, absent from London for near three weeks, previous to and up to the Monday preceding the trial. Did you ever call the attention of the counsel by word or letter to the difference between the statement in the brief and the affidavits of myself and servants respecting the dress of de Beringer? When did the counsel, to the best of your belief, discover the difference? Did I not send my servants to Guildhall on the 8th of June, the first day of the trial, to be examined? Did I not send you a note by them to inform you that I had sent them for that purpose? Did I not send them again on the second day of the trial, and did I not write to you on that day particularly requesting that they might be examined? When did you receive my second letter? Was it not prior to the close of my defence, and if subsequent, was it not at least several hours prior to the close of de Beringer's defence? Had the counsel, to your knowledge, resolved at all events not to examine my servants?' 
did you communicate to me such their determination? Have you any reason to believe that I had the least knowledge, prior to the trial being closed, that my servant would not be, or had not been, examined? If I had been informed that the counsel had refused to examine them, might I have not gone into court and personally demanded the examination of my witnesses? I am, etc. Cochrane, Messrs. Farrer and Co. Reader's note. Letter ends. New letter begins. Reader's note ends. Appendix 8. Lincoln's Inn Fields, August third, 1814. My Lord, we are duly honoured with your Lordship's letter of the 25th Ultimate, requiring our answers to many questions relating to the late prosecution. But after what has passed, and the communications we have already made, we hope your Lordship will agree with us in thinking that it would be highly improper in us now to answer any more abstract or partial questions. We have, agreeably to your uncle's desire, made out, and now beg leave to enclose you our bill in that business, in which you will find most of the facts to which your questions relate, stated as they occurred. We are, etc., Farrah and Co. End of Appendix 8 Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia Appendices 9 through 12 of Autobiography of a Seaman, Volume 2, by Lord Thomas Cochrane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 9, Westminster Election, Letter from the Right Honourable Richard Brinsley Sheridan to Arthur Morris, Esquire, High Bailiff of Westminster. Savile Row, Sunday evening, July 10, 1814. Sir, observing that you have called a meeting tomorrow to be held in Palace Yard, to consider of a fit person to fill up the present vacancy in the representation of the City of Westminster, and having myself received very earnest applications from numerous and independent bodies of its inhabitant householders, requiring that I should meet their wishes by proposing myself as a candidate, I take the freedom of addressing these lines to you to say that I absolutely decline to be put in nomination in opposition to Lord Cochrane. I send you this, my determination, without concert or communication with the respectable persons to whom I have above referred, and towards whom I must ever continue to give the utmost gratitude. I trust that I need not declare that I should have felt greatly honoured by having been again returned the representative of Westminster. My title to aspire to that distinction is simply that after more than thirty-one years' service in Parliament, I can, without fear of successful contradiction, assert that I never gave a vote that was not in support of the truth of liberty and in assertion of the people's rights, duly respecting at the same time the just prerogatives of the Crown, and revering the sacred principles upon which was founded and maintained the glory and the security of our unrivalled Constitution. Having these opinions as a public man, have I hitherto sat in the House of Commons, and never will I accept a seat there but on the sole condition of being the master of my own vote and voice, the servant only of my conscience. As to the present question which occasions your meeting tomorrow, I enter not into it. No man feels more the reverence due to the seats of justice, or the confidence due to the verdicts of juries. But under the circumstances of an expulsion from the House of Commons, I do not hesitate to say that I have a decided opinion that the expelled member has a right to appeal to his constituents with a view to the restitution of his seat and the rescue of his character. On these grounds, sir, I will not allow myself to interfere with the present appeal made on the part of Lord Cochrane, and to which I conceive him to be so justly entitled. In adopting this determination, I beg leave distinctly to state that I waive my claim to solicit the suffrages of the electors of Westminster, in favour of Lord Cochrane alone. I have the honour to be, sir, etc., Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Reader's note, Appendix 9 ends. Reader's note ends. Appendix 10. The Times, July 12, 1814. Westminster Meeting. Yesterday there was a very numerous meeting at Palace Yard, convened by the High Bailiff for the purpose of nominating a fit and proper person to represent the city of Westminster in Parliament. The High Bailiff shortly stated the purpose for which the present meeting was convened. He had received two letters, which it would be his duty to read to them. The one was from Lord Cochrane, open bracket, loud shouts of applause, close bracket, the other from Mr. Sheridan, 
open bracket, cries of no Sheridan, and loud expressions of disapprobation from the multitude who supposed that Mr. Sheridan was offering himself as a candidate. Close bracket. The letter from Lord Cochrane was first read. He enclosed to the High Bailiff a full and unmutilated account of the defence made by him at the House of Commons, which he requested him to read to the meeting. Open bracket. Many voices called out, read, read, while many others, both on account of the great length of it, as well as the danger of publishing certain passages of it, cried, no, no. Close bracket. The High Bailiff declined to read it. He then read the letter from Mr. Sheridan, waiving his claims in favour of Lord Cochrane. The High Bailiff then asked if any gentleman had anything to propose. Sir F. Burdett came forward amidst the loudest applause. He had on many occasions witnessed with pleasure the generous feeling and independent spirit of the electors of Westminster, but he had never on any occasion witnessed the ebullition of their feelings with such satisfaction as on the present occasion, as there never was one in which it was more important. The question now was whether an innocent individual, open bracket, loud applause, close bracket, for so he conceived him to be, should be destroyed by the machinations of corruption and power, or whether he should be supported by the voice of his constituents. He hoped that, by the suffrages of the electors of Westminster, that character would be maintained, which he thought had never in any instance been forfeited. They had heard a letter read from Mr. Sheridan, who had with great propriety and prudence withdrawn his pretensions such as they were. Of the value of that gentleman's claims and pretensions he would not now judge, but he thought that it was prudent and polite of him not to press them at present against the popular feeling and the current of public opinion. They had also heard a letter from Lord Cochrane, who wished his defence to be read to them at length. It was not surprising that the High Bailiff should decline reading that statement, or that no other person should be found bold enough to do so. At a time when libel was an offence so undefined in its nature, that no man knew when he might be speaking or writing libels, he could not himself say whether he was not about to speak libels. But that consideration should not prevent him from speaking the truth. Lord Cochrane had, however, with that fortitude which he had so often displayed in the defence of his country, and which had never been more strongly displayed than during the late trying occasion, ventured boldly to speak his mind in the House of Commons, and was now ready to incur all additional risks of publishing the statement he had there made. When he had made that statement, the Minister of the Country, or, as he should term him, the nose-leader of that illustrious and august body, open bracket, a laugh, close bracket, not having the power of gagging Lord Cochrane or preventing his assertion of his innocence, and knowing well the effect that such an appeal to the public would naturally produce, rose, in all the blushing honours of his blue ribbon, to impose silence upon the corrupt and degraded press that is still suffered to exist in this country. At the moment when the House of Commons was going to stigmatise Lord Cochrane with an additional vote, conveying censure, the minister thought that it was not proper that the people should hear his defence. Lord Cochrane, feeling, however, as a man of honour must do, that no risk was comparable to the loss of character, wished at every hazard to support his hitherto unsullied character and reputation. He therefore wished that his address should be read to the meeting, but the High Bailiff must, on such an occasion, be allowed to exercise his own discretion and judgment. When the uniform conduct of their chairman was taken into consideration, everybody must be convinced that his motives were always just and honourable, and therefore it would be most unhandsome in them to press him to act contrary to his own judgment in this particular instance. He felt it now unnecessary to detain the meeting with entering into a detail of the case. The statement of the noble lord had, however, explained those circumstances which appeared to require explanation. He should, not now, find fault with the jury that had tried Lord Cochrane, open bracket, who were, as he was informed, very respectable persons, close bracket, but he should for ever find fault with that mode of picking out a jury which Lord Cochrane had called packing them. He did not mean to find fault with the verdict which they found upon the evidence that was laid before them, evidence which was so skilfully and so artfully got up against him by those who had the arrangement of the prosecutor's case and which had been so feebly met by those who undertook the defence of Lord Cochrane. On such evidence they had found Lord Cochrane guilty of a fraud, of which he was sure that he was as incapable as any gentleman whom he had then the honour of addressing. The noble lord had certainly charged the noble and learned judge 
who tried him with a false statement of the facts of the case, and with a gross misdirection of the jury. As Lord Cochrane had been prevented by the rules of law from having the opportunity of having his case retried, he came now before the public for the vindication of his character. He should contend, however, that the rule which was set up against the granting of his lordship a new trial was contrary to the law, as the law never requires a man to do impossibilities. As, however, some of those who were tried with Lord Cochrane had fled from the country, and others were evidently not under his control, it was impossible that he should have been able to bring them all into court at the time he wished to move for a new trial. The principle, however, that the law never requires of a man to do impossibilities was maintained on another occasion with respect to those proceedings. When, on the part of some others who had been tried with him, an objection had been made to the indictment as not being sufficiently specific, the answer was, it was impossible to make it comprehend every point, and that the law did not require impossibilities. If the law, however, did not require impossibilities in the one case, neither would it require them in another. Open bracket, great applause, close bracket. They must all remember what an impression had been made on the public mind before the trial, by the publishing of evidence, if evidence it could be called, which was given before that body that designated themselves the Committee of the Stock Exchange. He was convinced that almost every man in the court had formed his opinion from this publication of evidence before the Stock Exchange Committee, before Lord Cochrane had been put upon his trial. He had heard of what was called the summing up of the noble judge, but his idea of a summing up was the statement of all the items on the one side and on the other, without addition or subtraction, and presenting to the jury a fair balance. His idea of a judge was that he should be a person free from passion or strong feeling on the case he was to try, but that he was to assist the jury by a clear and impartial statement of the evidence on the one side and on the other. The noble judge who tried Lord Cochrane was an eloquent person, and, as he thought, his eloquence on this occasion had been unfortunate for himself. He thought that he had been as eloquent as an advocate and as an impassioned advocate, Indeed, some of his phrases and metaphors appeared to him more nearly to resemble the language of poetry, open bracket, a laugh, close bracket, and would, as he thought, give him fairer pretensions to the situation of poet laureate than some who had aspired to it, open bracket, laughter, close bracket. When he had spoken of hunting down the chase and getting the skin, it reminded him of the old proverb that the man who sold the lion's skin, while the lion was yet alive, was killed himself in the chase. He believed that Lord Cochrane was not yet hunted down, but that, on the contrary, he was now turning against his hunters. It remained for the electors of Westminster to vindicate the character of an illustrious person who had rendered great services to his country. Open bracket, loud applause, close bracket. Services which, if he had even been guilty of the meanness imputed to him, should, as he thought, have protected him from the degrading infamy which it was now intended to have inflicted upon him. Open bracket, no, no, from many persons, as expressing a hope that the sentence would not be inflicted. Close bracket. He should hope that the malice of his enemies would not prevail, but even if he were to suffer that degrading punishment, he would confidently look for his acquittal to the unpacked and uncorrupted verdict of his constituents and his countrymen at large. He say that if Lord Cochrane was to stand in the pillory, he should feel it his duty to attend also. Open bracket loud shouts of applause, which lasted for many minutes. Close bracket. The disgrace that might be intended for Lord Cochrane would, so far from stamping him with infamy, remove in the public opinion the idea of infamy from the punishment of the pillory. No man that had hitherto conceived it an honour to follow the noble lord would, for the future, conceive it infamy to stand in the pillory in which he had stood. It appeared to him that instead of destroying Lord Cochrane, the infliction of that part of the sentence would destroy the punishment of the pillory for the future. If, even, Lord Cochrane had been guilty of the offence with which he was charged, would it be supposed that it was for that offence he had incurred such vengeance? Or would it not, rather, be supposed that the real crime, which could not be forgiven, was his bold and independent conduct in the defence of their rights and liberties? Open bracket, applause, close bracket. This was a crime as unpardonable in the eyes of some men as that which is called by religious men the sin against the Holy Ghost. How marked a difference was there between the punishment inflicted upon him 
and the treatment of the most notorious delinquents and depredators of the public purse. They, forsooth, are all honest gentlemen, and meant to pay back at some time or another, and by places and pensions they were often enabled to pay back to the public out of their own money. This put him in mind of a story he had once heard of a Scotch gardener who flourished and grew rich while his neighbours were failing. One of them, however, having got up very early in the morning, met him with a cart full of wool fruit, which he had stripped from their gardens, and asked him, "'Where are you going?' The Scotchman answered, "'I am going back again.' Open bracket, a laugh, close bracket. This was the case with the great public delinquents. When they were found out, they were let go back again. He had no doubt, but that with the sense they appeared to entertain, both of the innocence and merits of Lord Cochrane, they would enable him again to go to the house, not for the purpose of pruning that hateful system whose branches had extended so wide, but for the purpose of laying the axe to the root of corruption, open bracket, applause, close bracket, in order that a natural and wholesome vegetation might take its place. He had exerted himself to rescue the property of his gallant brethren in arms from the gripe of legal harpies. He had acted with independence in circumstances where it was not easy to act independently. He thought that a real independent representative, a man not connected with or swayed by any party, stood in rather a forlorn and difficult situation. Having said so much, he should leave the case of Lord Cochrane to their decision. To them, he should commit not his life, for that he had freely and often risked for honour at the cannon's mouth, but that immortal part, which was far dearer to a man of honour than his life, his reputation and his character. To them he now confidently made his appeal, and he trusted that he should not be disappointed. After a few more observations, he concluded by moving the following resolution. Resolved that in the opinion of this meeting, Lord Cochrane is perfectly innocent of the offence for which he has been sentenced to receive an infamous punishment. Mr. Wishart seconded the motion. Great pains, he said, had been taken to trace one part of the route of de Beringer, but not so much with respect to the other. He did not think that the witnesses on the trial were perjured, but Beringer might have brought the coat along with him in the bundle which he held in his hand. Lord Cochrane came forward like an innocent man and stated all that he knew of the transaction, nor could it be reasonably inferred that he was implicated in the fraud because Beringer came to his house. The rule of the court had placed Lord Cochrane in a most difficult and perplexing situation, a rule wholly unknown to the best times of the Constitution. Judges thus took the law in their own hands and encroached upon the functions of Parliament. He did not intend to arraign the conduct of the jury, though the verdict of the juries who had condemned Russell and Sidney had been subsequently reversed. Open bracket, loud applause, close bracket, because it had been improperly obtained, and the memory of those illustrious patriots would remain embalmed in the recollections of the latest posterity. Many judges had been an ornament to the country that gave them birth, such as Sir M. Hale, Lord Camden, and others, and would to God judges like them, always presided in the seat of justice. Every man who was actuated by a cause of justice, or by the feeling of humanity, would pour the balm of consolation into the wounded spirit of the noble lord, who had deserved so well of his country, and who, from some, at least, of his countrymen, had met with such an ungrateful return. Major Cartwright said there was nothing in any part of the evidence which warranted the learned lord, Ellenborough, in stating that de Beringer came to the house of Lord Cochrane emblazoned in all the costume of his crime. Such an assertion would only be accounted for upon the supposition that in his charge to the jury he had trusted rather to his memory than to his notes. The evidence against Lord Cochrane was like a grain of sand in one hand, while that in his favour was like Westminster Abbey in the other. Open bracket, loud, and reiterated applause. Close bracket. Mr. Walker thought that it was the duty of the noble lord's constituents to replace him in his situation as member for Westminster. Open bracket, shouts of applause. Close bracket. Mr. Alderman Wood, when he first heard of the charge against Lord Cochrane, had said he was innocent and that he had not the heart nor the disposition to commit a fraud. Open bracket, applause. Close bracket. After the trial, he was of the same opinion, and everything that had since taken place contributed still more to strengthen that belief. He had heard from one of the jury, open bracket, who had assured him that others of the jury were of the same sentiment, close bracket, that had the evidence since produced been brought forward upon the trial, or had Lord Cochrane been in court and made his own defence, it would have been impossible to have found him guilty. 
open bracket, bursts of applause, close bracket. If necessary, he could bring the individual alluded to before them, open bracket, bravo, bravo, close bracket. When he first heard of the result of the trial, he, as an elector of Westminster, had been turning in his mind whom it might be proper to propose for their representative. He was happy to think that now there was no opportunity for any deliberation of that kind, for the electors of Westminster would do justice to an injured character and return him, by their verdict, to that house from which he had been expelled. Open bracket, loud applause, close bracket. The resolution was then put and carried by acclamation. Sir F. Burdett then moved the second resolution, that it is therefore the opinion of this meeting that Lord Cochrane is a proper person to represent the City of Westminster in Parliament, and that he be put in nomination at the ensuing election. This was seconded by Mr. Sturch, and carried unanimously, and with great applause. Sir F. Burdett then moved the third, that a committee be appointed for the purpose of carrying into effect the foregoing resolutions, with power to add to their number. This was also agreed to, and Sir Francis proposed several names, among which were Mr. Alderman Wood, Mr. Brooks, Mr. Adams, and Mr. Jones Burdett, etc. The Honourable Baronet next moved the fourth resolution, that a subscription be entered into to defray the expenses of the ensuing election, toward which it is the bounden duty of every elector, and friend to purity of election, to contribute. It was seconded by Mr. Wishart, who said that as the City of Westminster had set an honourable example in returning members free of expense, it became their character to continue the practice, but their treasury was not inexhaustible, and he hoped that every friend to the purity of election would come forward and contribute on this occasion. Open bracket, applause, close bracket. Major Cartwright moved the fifth resolution, resolved that the thanks of this meeting be given to Sir Francis Burdett and the 43 honourable members who voted against the expulsion of Lord Cochrane. Sir F. Burdett returned thanks, and after a vote of thanks to the High Bailiff, the meeting broke up. Reader's note, end of Appendix 10. Appendix 11, The Morning Chronicle, July 18th, 1814, Westminster Election. On Saturday last, in pursuance of the notice of the High Bailiff, a numerous body of the Westminster electors met at the porch of St. Paul's, Covent Garden, to choose a fit person to represent their city in Parliament. At ten o'clock, proclamation was made, and the writ read, when Sir F. Burdett came forward on the hustings and, addressing the electors, said that in pursuance to the unanimous resolutions of the electors of Westminster in Palace Yard, he had appeared to put in practice that which was unanimously determined on at that time by putting in nomination the person whom they had determined to be worthy to represent them. And such was the effect which that unanimous expression of opinion had produced that, almost for the first time, they were not faced by any court candidate, for such was the weight that it carried, that it had imposed silence in all quarters. Open bracket, applause, close bracket. It would ill become him to detain them long from that great purpose. Great it was, for it was the purpose of doing justice and maintaining the oppressed, which they were that day assembled to accomplish. But he thought it his duty to add a few words on so novel and important an occasion. Open bracket, marks of approbation, close bracket. The assembly of that day presented the most august spectacle to the mind of man. It was the image of a free people, of a body of free men, appealed to in the last resort from all minor and inferior jurisdictions by an oppressed individual, oppressed by corrupt machinations and artful combinations. From whatever cause this oppression arose, it was enough that he was oppressed, and that he had appealed from his oppressors to the justice of the people at large. For the character by which the people of England was most distinguished was the love of justice. Open bracket, applause, close bracket. It was needless to attempt to display any of the merits peculiar to Lord Cochrane, because whatever these merits or demerits, if any such existed, of which he, Sir F. B., was not aware, were of little consequence. It was not in the view of personal merits or demerits, but in the defence of a man oppressed unjustly, as they believed, in support of justice, that they were called on to give their suffrages on this occasion. Though idle reports or malignant artifices had been played off against Lord Cochrane, even had they not carried in themselves their own refutation, they would have had no weight with the electors of Westminster. Free bodies of electors had always shown a disposition to support the oppressed, and particularly in the case of that individual whose apostasy had done such injury to the cause of liberty and who had always been thought by those who knew him intimately to have been unprincipled, John Wilkes. In that case, 
despite of all dislike to the character of a man, he was maintained because he was an object of oppression, and because he had avowed those principles of public liberty which could never fail to vibrate in the hearts of the people of England. Open bracket, loud applause, close bracket. We had lately had amongst us the great sovereigns of distant states, to whom we had shown the respect and kindness which they claimed from the regard they had shown to human liberty and human happiness, when, had they appeared in their artificial characters of princes only, they might have passed unheeded without any marks of our affection and regard. Open bracket, applause, close bracket. He regretted that they had now departed from this country without seeing what he, Sir F.B., then saw, and which outshone all the shows and entertainments, open bracket, a laugh, close bracket, with which, as a mark of respect, they had been justly entertained. The spectacle of a free people, in the act of maintaining an oppressed fellow citizen, against the arm of corruption and power, open bracket, applause, close bracket. Such a spectacle as this, no other nation on earth could afford. Readers note, there is an ellipsis. We had heard a great deal lately about hoaxes, especially of that in which my Lord Cochrane had been so innocently and unfortunately implicated. We have been told of a trial by a jury, who are supposed to be impartial men, taken at random. Now my Lord Cochrane has been tried, though I think no blame attaches to the jury who tried him, who, I think, under the circumstances did their duty, not by a jury of the country, but by a packed and selected jury. There is no greater hoax than to try a man by such a jury, open bracket, applause and laughter, close bracket, and to tell him he had been tried by a jury of his country. We have been told that the judge should not only be impartial and sit on the bench as a stone with no feeling, but with all judgment, but that he should be a counsel for the prisoner. What sort of counsel for Lord Cochrane was my Lord Ellenborough? Open bracket, loud laughter and applause, close bracket. Indeed, my Lord Cochrane has been the most hoaxed of any man. Open bracket, applause, close bracket. That very morning he, open bracket, Sir F. Burdett, close bracket, had been looking into a newspaper which was famous for hoaxing and which formerly produced the fabricated French letters. He meant the Morning Post. Open bracket, a laugh, close bracket. In that paper, there was a paragraph stating that the Princess Charlotte was delighted at her residence at Carlton House and was highly gratified to see her old friends about her. This, he should conceive, was somewhat of a hoax. Open bracket, a laugh. Close bracket. It was given out to the public that those gigaws in the parks, that the childish amusement of squibs and crackers, were all intended solely for the delight of the British public, which public, by the way, would have to pay all the expenses out of its own pockets. Was this not a hoax? Open bracket, a laugh. Close bracket. But there was one still greater. There was a large body of placemen who grow rich with the public money, and yet were so fastidiously delicate that they could not endure that any peculator of a different stamp should associate with them. Those immaculate persons who thus lived by the public purse chose to call themselves the representatives of the people of England. He trusted that the example set by the city of Westminster would spread through every part of the kingdom, and that the corrupt would be taught that England was not to be so represented. If other places would act like Westminster and return their members to Parliament, not only without expense, but without the least solicitation, in that case corruption would receive, if not her death blow, yet such a wound as would prevent her from ever reassuming an influence pernicious to the best interests of the country. He would now propose to them Sir Thomas Cochrane, commonly called Lord Cochrane, as a fit representative to serve them in Parliament. Open bracket, great applause. Close bracket. Mr. Sturch seconded the motion. He had never had any personal or political connection with Lord Cochrane till he had visited his lordship in prison, and he should support his lordship because he was persuaded that he had been condemned on imperfect evidence, and because the severity of his sentence was such as to astonish the whole nation. The High Bailiff then put the question, which was carried with acclamations and unanimously, and the High Bailiff then declared Lord Cochrane to be elected. Open bracket, loud applause, close bracket. Alderman Wood next addressed the meeting. He began by alluding to some newspapers, which had called his conversation with the juryman chit-chat. He denied that it was chit-chat. It was a solemn assertion made by a gentleman in the name of himself and some of his fellow jurors. He begged the electors to dismiss from their minds these calumnies which had appeared respecting Lord Cochrane's treatment of his father. He had made the most anxious inquiries into the matter and had gone late last night to gain more particular information and he was able to assure them positively that Lord Cochrane had always been distinguished for his kindness, generosity, and attention to his poor unfortunate father. It was evident that there existed somewhere a very vindictive feeling towards Lord Cochrane, 
as a proof he would mention that order of the secretary of state which directed that the punishment of the pillory should take place on the tenth of august open bracket cries of no pillory close bracket now it had always been usual to leave the time to the discretion of the sheriff who never inflicted this punishment at so early a period after the sentence if he himself were sheriff he should refuse to obey such an order and should content himself with alleging that the time appointed did not suit him open bracket great applause close bracket the worthy alderman concluded by an allusion to the paragraph concerning the princess charlotte he had reason to know that in spite of all the high satisfaction which she was said to feel in her own residence she had made three attempts to escape open bracket laughter and applause the usual thanks followed and the meeting dispersed Reader's note, end of Appendix 11. Appendix 12. Cobbett's Political Register, July 30th, 1814. Re-election of Lord Cochrane. In consequence of the unanimous return of his lordship to fill his seat in Parliament as one of the representatives for the City of Westminster, the following letters pass between his lordship and Mr. Brooks, Treasurer of the Westminster Committee. It is a fact perhaps not generally known that with the exception of one or two newspapers, the London journals have thought proper to refuse giving publicity to this correspondence. Such indeed is the degraded state of our press that the editor of a Sunday paper in giving his lordship's letter omitted several of the most striking passages in it, which, as was done in publishing his defence, he supplied with stars. Reader's note letter begins. Committee Room, King Street, Covent Garden, July 16th, 1814. My lord, I am directed by the Committee of Electors of Westminster, appointed at the general meeting held in New Palace Yard on Monday the 11th instant, to acquaint your lordship that you were this morning nominated as a fit and proper person to fill the vacancy in the representation of the City of Westminster in Parliament, occasioned by your lordship's expulsion, and that you were immediately re-elected without opposition, and with the most lively expressions of universal approbation. The committee further direct me to convey to your lordship their sincere congratulations on an event so happily demonstrative of the sense which your constituents entertain of the accusation which has been brought against you, and of the very extraordinary proceedings by which it has been followed up, and to assure your lordship that it affords them the highest gratification to find that you are able to oppose to the envenomed shafts of malice and party spirit the impenetrable shield of conscious innocence. They rejoice to see that the prejudices occasioned by gross and shameless misrepresentation are fast wearing away from the public mind, and they trust that the time is near when your lordship's character will appear as fair and unblemished in the view of every individual in the British Empire, as it now does in the eyes of the electors of Westminster. I have the honour to be, my lord, your lordship's most faithful and obedient servant. Samuel Brooks, Chairman. To Lord Cochrane. Reader's note, letter ends, new letter begins. King's Bench, July 18th, 1814. Sir, amongst all the occurrences of my life, I can call to memory no one which has produced so great a degree of exhalation in my breast as this, which, through a channel which I so highly esteem, has been communicated to me that, after all the machinations of corruption, open bracket, bringing into play her choicest agents, close bracket, have been able to effect against me, the citizens of Westminster have, with unanimous voice, pronounced me worthy of continuing to be one of their representatives in Parliament, merely to be a member of the House of Commons, as now made up, is something too meagre to be a gratification to me. But when I reflect on that love of country, that devotion to freedom, that soundness of judgment, that unshaken adherence to truth and justice, which have invariably marked the proceedings of the citizens of Westminster, and when I further reflect that it is of Sir Francis Burdett, whom they have now, for the third time, made me the colleague, how am I to express, on the one hand, my gratitude towards them, and on the other, the contempt which I feel for all the distinctions of birth, and for all the wealth, and all the decorations which ministers and kings have it, under the present system, in their power to bestow. With regard to the case, the agitation of which has been the cause of this, to me most gratifying result, I am in no apprehension as to the opinions and feelings of the world, and especially of the people of England, whom, though they may be occasionally misled, are never deliberately cruel or unjust." Only let it be said of me, the Stock Exchange have accused, Lord Ellenborough has charged for guilty, the special jury have found that guilt, the court have sentenced to the pillory, the House of Commons have expelled, and the citizens of Westminster have re-elected. Only let this be the record placed against my name, and I shall be proud to stand in the calendar of criminals all the days of my life. In requesting you, sir, to convey these my sentiments, 
to my constituents at large, I cannot refrain from begging you and the other gentlemen of the committee to accept my particular and unfeigned thanks. I am, sir, your most obedient, humble servant, Cochrane, to Samuel Brooks, Esquire, Chairman of the Committee of the Electors of Westminster. End of Appendix 12. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendices 13 through 17 of Autobiography of a Seaman, Volume 2, by Lord Thomas Cochrane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 13. To the Electors of Westminster, King's Bench, August the 10th, 1814. Gentlemen, it is fresh in your recollection that when Lord Ebrington, contrary to my opinion, which was conveyed by letter to his lordship and at my request read by him to the house made his motion for a remission of that part of the sentence which was to have been executed this day lord castlereagh was empowered to state that the prince regent had already done that which it was the object of lord ebrington's motion to effect you will also remember that lord castlereagh instead of immediately making his communication and preventing an unnecessary and consequently improper discussion withheld it from the house for a considerable time and thus afforded the attorney and solicitor general and himself an opportunity of making a new and violent assault upon my character and conduct although many of their arguments had been previously refuted and others were well answered at the time yet it was impossible for those honourable members who entertained a favourable opinion of me to answer every accusation which the solicitor general and others brought forward by surprise it remains therefore for me to offer some observations in my own defence in which my reason will appear for having suffered some delay to occur in the execution of this important duty in the course of the solicitor general's speech he asserted that in my defence i had misstated the circumstances of the transaction and had charged my solicitors with a gross dereliction of duty i shall now show that i have neither misstated circumstances nor made any unfounded accusation he further asserted that he would take upon himself to say that the brief had been drawn up from my own instructions the fact is i have never denied that i gave instructions for the brief it is true however that i gave no specific instructions to counsel and attended no consultation but it is obvious that without some instructions or some information from me to my solicitors there could have been no brief at all my solicitors themselves applied to me for written instructions and i of course furnished them with such particulars as occurred to me on the subject which are written on one sheet of paper and might have been written on one page this paper is endorsed by my solicitors lord cochrane's minutes of case and may be seen in my possession readers note footnote it was discovered by his majesty's law officers that these few hints or minutes of case given to my solicitors at their own solicitation preparatory to drawing the brief furnish a contradiction to my assertion in the house that i gave no instructions to counsel I was desirous of giving these learned gentlemen the full benefit of the discovery by making them public, when I published this address to the electors of Westminster, that was prevented by a suggestion that the address, with the other important documents annexed, were already too long for a communication to the newspapers, and so the editor of one of those prints appears to have thought, for he omitted two very important and inoffensive paragraphs. As the same reasons no longer exist, I insert the minutes of case between the address and the questions to the solicitors. Readers note footnote ends. I apprehend that it was the duty of my solicitors to have sent me a copy of the brief, which, however, they did not, and I repeat that previous to the trial I never read it. It appears that they particularly called my attention to an unimportant circumstance which they had inserted in the brief, or the examinations attached, in consequence of an erroneous communication from my servant, who had confounded the circumstances of two different occurrences. Readers note footnote see this explained in the answer to an anonymous letter at the end which is note footnote ends this was the one particular which the solicitor general says that i myself corrected i admitted that this error was expunged by my authority and opposite the four lines which contained it is written read this to lord cochrane which i think is an argument that the greater part of the brief was not read to me particularly as there are twelve lines expunged in another place opposite which my name does not appear my solicitors, however, assert that, though I did not read the brief myself, 
they read the greater part of it to me and on their assertion i will admit that they did so though i have no recollection of the fact but if it could be shown that they drew my attention to every line of the brief except only to that one most important point the description of de beringer's dress which immediately follows the four lines expunged i still think that they were guilty of very reprehensible negligence in my affidavit which was before them and was introduced into the brief the coat worn by de beringer is sworn to have been green and in the examination attached to the brief it is stated to have been red it is impossible that this most important difference could have escaped their observation and yet it is true that they never called my attention to it i may affirm without fear of being again contradicted that i did not know that the dress of de beringer which i had sworn to be green was in any part of the brief much less in the examinations of my servants described to be red because it is impossible unless i had been absolutely insane that i should not only have been satisfied with the brief which authorised my counsel to contradict my own affidavit but have been anxious to send my servants into court to give evidence against me if my solicitors actually read this part of the brief to me it was obvious that i was not giving that attention which a man conscious of guilt naturally would have given the word red if i had heard it must have instantly excited my particular notice but if the difference between red and green escaped my observation what did my solicitors think of it readers note footnote in more than one account of lord ellenborough's charge his lordship was represented to have said if the difference between red and green escaped lord cochrane's observation what did he think of the star and medallion readers note footnote ends my accusers chiefly depended for my conviction on proving that de beringer appeared before me in the red coat in which he had committed the fraud is it possible that one of my solicitors should have read it to me and not have said you observe lord cochrane that this is contrary to your affidavit to have read it to me without a pause and have suffered it to pass without observation is i think as negligent as not to have read it at all and is wholly irreconcilable with the assertion of mr abercrombie that both parts of the brief were read over to me with the utmost care if in my defence in the house of commons i did not state the manner in which i apprehended the difference between the brief and the affidavit originated it was because i could not have stated it without throwing the more blame on my solicitors than i felt inclined to do i have been challenged by the attorney-general to unseal the lips of my solicitors and counsel my solicitors however did not wait for me to unseal their lips as is evident by what is called the counter-statement which they thought proper to furnish mr abercrombie and others and i think it rather unreasonable to require me to unseal the lips of my counsel to qualify them to give evidence against me when i could not succeed in unsealing their lips on the trial to speak one word in my behalf my own counsel mr topping and mr scarlett whom i fully expected would have advocated my cause never spoke in my defence in saying this however i cast no blame on those gentlemen because i have no doubt that under the circumstances then known to them they acted as they thought best neither do i mean to blame mr sergeant best the counsel for mr johnston who contrary to my expectation and direction defended my cause in conjunction with that of his own client he made as able a speech as any advocate could have done with the information he possessed and under his then circumstances but he intimated at the time and afterwards authorised me to assert that he was not able to do justice to the cause and it is a just ground of complaint that after mr sergeant best had been exhausted for fifteen hours close attention and confinement he was not allowed a few hours to recover himself and prepare for the defence to return i do however accept the daring of the attorney-general and freely release my solicitors and counsel from every obligation of secrecy it is note, footnote i have not learnt that any of these gentlemen have made any disclosures in consequence of this release in footnote i might perhaps have done this sooner but the delay has not been occasioned by any doubt in my mind as to the propriety of the step or fear of the consequences i thought however after the statement which has been circulated by my solicitors that it was my duty in the first place to put to them certain questions which i was not aware would have occasioned much delay but after a lapse of nearly a fortnight they wrote to inform me that they thought it would be improper to answer those questions i now lay them before the public i particularly authorised the counsel employed for the defence to state their reasons for determining to defend me co-jointly with mr johnston 
Contrary to the opinion of Mr. Adam expressed on the 6th of May, contrary to their own opinion expressed on the 24th of May, and contrary to my opinion and direction expressed on the 29th of May, and I also particularly authorised them to assign the reason for their opinion that no witnesses ought to be examined on my part. Reader's note footnote from an item in my solicitor's bill dated June 6th, only two days before the trial, I extract the following. Attending a consultation at Mr. Sergeant Best's chambers, when your case was fully considered, and all the counsel were decidedly of the opinion that you must be defended jointly with the other defendants, and the counsel recommended your servants being in attendance on the trial, although they still remained of the opinion that neither they nor any other witness ought to be examined on your part. In a subsequent item, dated June 7th, the day before the trial, I am represented to have acquiesced, not, however, in the non-examination of my witness, but in the joint defence. It appears, however, that I held out to the last, and if I did acquiesce, it was then high time to do so, otherwise, in all probability, I should not have been defended at all. Reader's note, footnote ends. And especially their reasons for not examining my servants on the subject of de Beringer's dress, notwithstanding my earnest desire to have them examined. I am also willing, nay, I am anxious, that Mr. Sergeant Best should state whether, when he admitted that the coat was red and not green, he did not imagine that I had sworn falsely by design. I know that in his speech he attributed my description of the coat to error only, but I am anxious to know whether he did so from his feelings as a man or his sense of duty as an advocate. Until I am better informed, I shall incline to the opinion that he was actuated by the latter feeling only, because if he really imagined that he had to defend an innocent man, I do think that he would not, without previously communicating with me on the subject, have had recourse to the dangerous expedient of admitting that to be red, which I have sworn to be green, however embarrassed he might have been by the confusion of his brief, or exhausted by the fatigue and long confinement which he had undergone. I stated in the House of Commons that I gave no instructions to counsel, and attended no consultation. I now see the folly of this negligence, for, if I had personally attended to my interests, and conferred with my advocates on the subject, I have no doubt that I should have fully convinced them of my innocence. I believe that, subsequent to the trial, there is not a single individual with whom I have conferred on the subject who has not left me with that impression. To come now to the manner in which the error in the brief originated, I have no hesitation in acknowledging that I am at issue with my solicitors on that point. Their account is that two of my servants, whom I had sent to their office to be examined, as to the evidence they could give on the trial, admitted that de Beringer wore a red coat with a green collar. My servants, on the contrary, assure me that they did not, and could not, admit that it was a red coat, because when they saw de Beringer he wore a great coat, buttoned up, and they neither saw the body nor the skirts of the undercoat, but the collar, and so much of the breast as they saw, were green. But they admit that, on being questioned by my solicitors whether they could swear that it was not a red coat, they confessed that they could not, and admitted that it might be red, and that the green, which they saw, might be green facings to a military coat. But they have constantly declared that no part which they saw was red, and they deny that they ever admitted that they saw any red. My solicitors were in possession of their previous affidavits describing de Beringer to have worn a grey great coat, buttoned up, and a coat with a green collar underneath. I shall not deny that my solicitors considered the admissions of the servants to amount to an acknowledgment that the coat was red, but I shall ever believe that such admissions actually went no further than that, since they did not see the body of the coat, it might, for aught they knew, be red, and possibly that they supposed it was red, because the wearer having a sword and military cap, they conceived him to be an army officer. The description, which my solicitors introduced into the brief in consequence of this examination, namely a red coat with a green collar, neither accords with my description, nor with the coat actually worn by de Beringer on his way from Dover, which, as proved by witness on the trial, was either wholly scarlet or turned up with yellow. If I had been a party to the fraud, and had sworn falsely as to the colour of the coat, I doubtless might also have been wicked enough to have endeavoured to suborn the servants to perjure themselves in my behalf. But I should hardly have ventured to send them to my solicitors to be examined on the subject, without previously instructing them myself, and it can hardly be supposed that, if they had been on their guard from any previous instructions of mine, that my solicitors, in the common course of examination, 
would have obtained from them any evidence which mitigated against my own statement. I should naturally, too, have felt some anxiety to know the result of their examination, yet the truth is that I never asked them a single question on their return from the solicitor's office. Indeed, if I had questioned them, as narrowly as one may suppose a guilty man who had sent his servants on a guilty errand of so much danger and importance would have questioned them, I should in all probability have discovered whether they had or had not executed that errand to my satisfaction. In all events, I should have been anxious to know the result of their examination, as entered in the brief, and if it be true that it was actually read to me by my solicitor, I must, under such circumstances, have lent too attentive an ear to have suffered the ruinous word read to have escaped my observation. I must, too, have shown certain symptoms of uneasiness on hearing that word, which could not have escaped the observation of the reader, particularly as the contradiction between that word and my oath must have been present to his mind. And lastly, with the knowledge that the brief contained a flat and fatal contradiction to my own affidavit out of the mouths of my own servants, I should hardly have suffered it to have gone to my counsel in that state, and then have pressed, in the way in which I did press, to have those servants examined at the trial. How my solicitors could admit so fatal contradiction into the brief without drawing my attention to it immediately by letter, it is for them to explain. Yet they admit that they never wrote to me on the subject. They very quietly, however, inserted it and let it remain in the brief until I should happen to discover it, which, as I have pretty clearly proved, never did happen previous to the trial. It was on the second day of the trial, and not before, that to my very great surprise I discovered in a newspaper the admission of my counsel in contradiction to my affidavit, quote, yet, end quote, says the Attorney General, quote, there was no mistake and no surprise. If there had, the judges would have dispensed with their rule and granted a new trial, but no, there was nothing of that sort here, end quote. In whatever way my solicitors took the examination of my servants on the subject of de Beringer's dress, it is indisputable that nothing can justify their neglect in not immediately drawing my attention to the difference between the result of that examination and the statement in my own affidavit. Quote, it can never be permitted, end quote, said the Solicitor General, quote, that a person accused should try in the first instance how far he could go without his own witnesses, and then, should the result prove unfavourable, how far he could go with them, end quote. How unjust this observation is, as applied to me, is well known to my solicitors. They well know how anxious I was to have my witnesses brought forward in the first instance. Those witnesses would and could conscientiously have sworn to the green collar, which would have sufficiently corroborated the description in my affidavit, as it never was pretended that de Beringer wore a green collar to his scarlet coat. It was asked by the Attorney General, quote, if the servants could have confirmed the affidavit, where was the advocate who could have been stupid enough to hesitate to produce them. End quote. It is possible, however, that the advocates may be prejudiced, may be mistaken, and may be misled by their brief. It is, note, footnote. it is also possible that they may be compelled to attempt the exercise of their duty when incapacitated by faintness and fatigue. Footnote ends. I hope that it will now appear to be satisfactorily proved not only that I did not see de Beringer in his scarlet coat, but that he did not come to my door, nor even enter the hackney coach in that dress. See the annexed affidavits. In reply to the Solicitor General's observation that I had sought to establish my own innocence by recrimination upon the judge and jury, I shall at present merely ask the learned gentleman whether he is of the opinion that a like sentence for a like offence would have been passed on any nobleman or member of Parliament on his side of the House. Would a punishment which according to the unfortunate admission of the Governor-General, is calculated, quote, to bow down the head with humiliation ever after, end quote, together with fine and imprisonment, and the privation of every office and honour, have been thought little enough for a mysterious defendant on such charge. And if the candour of the learned gentleman impels him to answer in the negative, is it not fair to inquire whether he thinks that such an one would even have been convicted on similar evidence? The Attorney-General observed, quote, that he was glad that the period had arrived when the trial could be read at length and thus do away with the effect of those imperfect statements which misled the public mind. End quote. Reserving my remarks on the trial for a future opportunity, I shall, at present, just ask the Attorney General how it comes that he, who is so anxious that the public mind should not be misled, should have made the unfounded assertion that I not only pocketed a large sum of money by the fraud, but put off absolute ruin. 
such an assertion is the more inexcusable in the attorney-general who had every facility of obtaining more correct information his own broker could have told him that the omnium which i possessed on the nineteenth of february when the fraud must have been in agitation could have been sold on that day at twenty seven and five eighths the average cost was twenty seven and seven eighths so the whole loss on the hundred and thirty nine thousand pounds omnium if sold on that day would not have amounted to above four hundred pounds and when it is considered that the result of my previous speculations was a gain of four thousand two hundred pounds received and eight hundred and thirty pounds in the hands of my broker how does the attorney-general make it out that i had so embarrassed myself by such speculations as to have no other than fraudulent means of escaping absolute ruin besides i can assure the learned gentleman if he is not already appraised of the fact that if i had held the omnium till the first third or fourth of march i should have sold it at a profit and if i had held it till the settling day when i must of necessity have sold it i should not have lost half the sum i had previously gained but if upon the whole i had lost a few hundreds or even a few thousands how would the attorney-general be justified in inferring my absolute ruin it is well known that i had been more successful at sea than almost any other officer of my standing in the navy and that i have constantly lived not only within my income but at less expense than almost any other person of my rank in society on what grounds therefore is the attorney-general warranted in representing me as a person in such desperate circumstances as to be obliged to have recourse to the lowest knavery in order to avert absolute ruin with respect to the other assertion that i pocketed a large sum of money in consequence of the transactions of the twenty first of february did not the learned lawyer know that the stock exchange committee had seized not only one thousand seven hundred pounds of my money which was my actual profit from that day's sale but also a further sum of seven hundred and seventy pounds to answer their exaggerated calculation of that profit and that the aforementioned sum of eight hundred and thirty pounds was also lost through the proceedings of that committee if the learned gentleman knew nothing of all of this i can only observe that he ought to have informed himself on the subject before he made such statements in the house of commons i have the honour to be gentlemen with great respect your most obedient and faithful servant cochran readers note end of appendix thirteen appendix fourteen addresses from paisley canal street paisley august eighteenth eighteen fourteen sir by inserting the following address to lord cochrane and the electors of westminster you will oblige your readers in this place accustomed as we have been to the acts of the abettors of corruption it is with a mixture of pity and contempt we have witnessed the eagerness with which they have endeavoured to heap every sort of contumely upon lord cochrane's head thanks to his numerous friends they have in this instance been wretchedly disappointed and though he has been stripped of those honours which the breath of kings can bestow he still retains what they have not the power to give or take away the applause and admiration of his grateful countrymen yours with great respect john mcnaught w cobbett esq at the meeting of the inhabitants of paisley in the salutation inn upon august the fifth eighteen fourteen for the purpose of celebrating the triumph of lord cochrane the following addresses to the electors of westminster and to lord cochrane were agreed to to the electors of westminster gentlemen the times in which we live have been denominated a new era they have produced so many extraordinary and marvellous events that we cannot help thinking the designation just but such has been their effect on the public mind that we almost cease to wonder at anything however extraordinary were it not for this apathy this callous effect scarcely anything in modern times could have made a deeper impression than the trial and condemnation of your representative lord cochrane in spite however of this disadvantage we rejoice to find that this event has produced the very impression it ought to have made it has produced an impression at once calculated to confound the malice of his enemies to cheer the heart of every patriot and to cherish the spirit of justice and independence which has long been dear to every briton allow us therefore to congratulate you and your country on the signal triumph which justice has obtained in your re-election of lord cochrane an election which could only proceed from a universal consciousness of the innocence of his lordship and which has placed that innocence on an immovable foundation you have had many struggles with corruption in all of which you have appeared as illustrious examples to mankind in this last instance you have if possible surpassed yourselves you have appeared as the focus of justice it has been your prerogative to give the public feeling effect we would by no means be understood to insinuate anything to the prejudice of the jury 
which tried his lordship, trial by jury we hold so sacred and invaluable, that we deprecate any reflection that would seem to throw a shade on so glorious an institution, but we may freely observe that, like every other human institution, it must be liable to abuse. We can easily imagine that a jury may be placed in such circumstances as to be rendered absolutely incapable of knowing the truth, a villainous arrangement of the evidence to be produced, a malicious and undue influence on the part of the judge, etc., may deceive a jury, and produce as much evil under the forms of law as private vengeance could inflict. But while it is said that Lord Cochrane was tried and condemned by a special jury, it will also be said that he was tried by the electors of Westminster. He was tried by his country and acquitted. We conclude by expressing our hope that whenever the hydra of corruption shall put forth her head, you will be found at your posts, ready to strike it off and inflict a mortal wound. The times are still ominous, and the nation has its eyes fixed on you. We trust that you will not relax in your vigilance till malice and injustice hide their diminished heads, and innocence no longer finds its only solace in heart-corroding grief. We are, gentlemen, etc. John McNaught, Chairman. To Lord Cochrane. My lord, there is such a dissonance between conscious innocence and imputed guilt that an upright mind must necessarily be confounded on receiving an atrocious charge, and even when the falsehood of the charge is made apparent, the recollection of it is often so bitter and its consequences so injurious as almost to equal the pangs and the deserved punishment of real guilt. Your case, my lord, is one of a singular complexion, trained in the paths of honour, habituated to patriotic deeds and high exploits, and possessing, in an eminent degree, that noble disinterestedness, that open frankness, peculiar to a naval life. To you, the recent charge must have been extremely galling. Convinced of your innocence, permit us to approach your lordship to express the interest we have taken in that extraordinary affair. When the charge was first preferred, we considered its improbability so great as to require the strongest evidence to make it good. We rejoiced to find such evidence was wanting. Nay, more, the lofty spirit of independence, the keen sense of honour which you manifested throughout the whole affair, your astonishing address before the House of Commons, and subsequent illustrations, has destroyed every vestige of guilt and placed your lordship's innocence in the most advantageous point of view. The universal sentiment in your favour, but especially the admirable conduct of the electors of Westminster, have raised you to a higher eminence than that from which you had fallen. You were indeed guilty of a crime, a crime unpardonable in the eyes of corruption. You had dictated energy and efficiency to warlike measures. You sought the glory and happiness of your country. You sought for justice to your associates in war. Was it then to be wondered at that malice should make you a favourite mark? No, my lord, but thanks to this enlightened age, her shafts have been diverted in their course, and by their obliquity have centred in herself. My lord, allow us to conclude by expressing our confidence that the circumstances which have called forth this address will, if possible, strengthen your habits and elevate your patriotic views, that when the time arrives for resuming public functions, you will be found the same intrepid, fearless champion of public and private right you have ever been." Except, my lord, the assurance of our regard. John McNaught, Chairman. End of Appendix 14. Appendix 15. Address from Culross. Address presented to Lord Cochrane by the inhabitants of Culross. We, the inhabitants of the Royal Burr of Culross and neighbourhood, beg leave to offer your lordship our heartfelt congratulations on being re-elected a member to serve in the House of Commons for one of the first cities in the kingdom, which event may be considered as the verdict of the last tribunal to whom you had appealed from the charges lately preferred against you. While the firmness with which you met those charges has called forth our highest admiration, we rejoice that they have now been so clearly proved to be unfounded, and that the cloud which threatened your destruction has been dispelled. In the joy everywhere diffused on this occasion, none can more cordially participate than the inhabitants of Culross. We beg to assure your lordship of their unabated attachment to and respect for the family of Dundonnell. Calling to mind the many heroic actions your lordship has performed in your country's cause, we look forward with confidence to a renewal of your ardent and gallant exertions for her advantage, notwithstanding the persecutions you are now suffering. And we sincerely hope that, that in defiance of party and faction, you shall again shine forth an ornament to your profession, an honour to your country, and the boast of this place, the ancient residence of your noble family. 
We beg also to express our wish that your lordship may speedily forget those sufferings an honourable mind must sustain whilst struggling against gross and unfounded accusations. Signed in the presence, and by the appointment of the meeting, W. Melvin, B. John Corr, Secretary. End of Appendix 15. Appendix 16. Lord Cochrane's answer to address from Culross. King's Bench, August 18th, 1814. Sir, I take the earliest opportunity, which the pleasure of my affairs afforded me, of conveying to my much-respected friends of Culross my heartfelt thanks for the interest they take in my character and welfare, and for the truly gratifying manner in which they have demonstrated their feelings, which are at once an honour to themselves and to me. You may with great truth assure our respectable townsmen that their unfeigned congratulations on my re-election add greatly to the satisfaction which I derive from that triumphant event, and that, whatever may be the value of my actions, the motives in which they originate ever have been and ever shall be, such as may claim the reward of their good opinion. I send you a newspaper containing the letter of de Beringer, by which you will perceive that my enemies have now an agent even within the confines of my prison. But I shall eventually triumph over all their machinations. Reader's Note, End of Appendix 16 Appendix 17 Address of the Inhabitants of Kirkcaldy to the Electors of Westminster Kirkcaldy, September the 8th, 1814 In consequence of previous intimation, a considerable number of well-disposed and respectable persons of Kirkcaldy assembled at the Wellington Inn here for the purpose of forming a congratulatory address to the Honourable, Free and Independent Electors of Westminster on their re-election of the Right Honourable Lord Cochrane. When the following was publicly read and approved of, ordered to be signed by the chairman in the name of the meeting, and transmitted by the secretary to the Honourable Sir Francis Burdett, Baronet. William Davidson in the chair. Gentlemen, in imitation of the very respectable inhabitants of Paisley, we now presume to step forward to congratulate you on the laudable and praiseworthy step you have lately taken in re-electing the Right Honourable Lord Cochrane, as one of your members for Westminster, whom the base time-servers of the day had, through wicked and deceitful means, unwarrantably deprived of his seat in Parliament. Not satisfied with this, his lordship's enemies pushed matters so far as to obtain a sentence of pillory, fine, and imprisonment, as if he had been a common felon, nay more, deprive him of those laurels he had so magnanimously won, and so justly merited at the hands of his country." His Lordship's firmness and praiseworthy resignation under these uncommon sufferings we cannot too much admire and respect, and we fondly hope that, notwithstanding all these afflictions, his innocence will soon be confirmed by the exposure of those base intriguers and their intrigues to the utter confusion of all time-serving placemen and their confederate hirelings. We rejoice that His Lordship possesses laurels more noble and lasting which it is not in the power of princes nor their advisers to bestow or take away. We also trust that when his lordship shall assume his honourable seat, he will be more emboldened than heretofore, in conjunction with your other honourable member, Sir Francis Burdett, in opposing corruption and its abettors, till the nation, roused from its lethargy, shall unite in behalf of all those who have been unjustly wronged, and thus will our happy little island outvie and triumph over all her enemies, both at home and abroad. Gentlemen, we hope and flatter ourselves that you will have no cause to lament the re-election of your right honourable member. We have no doubt that his lordship will be proud of the honour you have done him, as it cannot but attach him more closely to you and to the interests of the nation. We know that many thousands in Britain rejoice at the step you have taken and the victory obtained by his lordship, who nevertheless are afraid to show themselves, lest, like some of the old, they are put out of the synagogue. We still hope, however, that the stigma cast on his lordship's friends, instead of intimidating them, will rather embolden them to come forward and publicly declare the sense they have of his lordship's innocence, that the honourable and praiseworthy electors of Westminster may prosper and succeed in all of their laudable undertakings, and long enjoy the distinguished services of their able and truly honourable representatives, and when they shall have done their duty in their day and generation, that others, in succession, may fill their place who shall equal them in abilities and fortitude, is the ardent wish of this meeting. Signed by appointment, William Davidson, Chairman.
End of Appendices 13 through 17. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendices 18 through 20 of Autobiography of a Seaman, Volume 2, by Lord Thomas Cochrane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 18. The Times, July 13th, 1814. Sir, a constant reader of your journal takes the liberty of inquiring whether any measures have been adopted on the stock exchange to put a stop to that illicit practice of time bargaining which could alone present a sufficient temptation to the authors of the late imposition, and will, if not abolished, continue to hold out similar inducements to the commission of similar frauds. To punish the invention of false news, with the particular view to affect the funds, and yet to suffer such practices in the funds, as are both of themselves illegal, and also give occasion to the invention of the falsehoods, must appear to every one to be highly preposterous. In fact, the invention of false news and time bargaining must be considered but as different parts of the same act. They sprung up together, have grown and thriven together, and whatever some may suppose, are of no very recent birth. Lord Cochrane has, in truth, been found guilty of that which has been, in a less degree perhaps, practised without disgrace almost every week in the year, upon change, namely a conspiracy to affect the price of stock, by the invention and circulation of false news. And if it was necessary for the noble conspirator and his friends to put in motion a greater apparatus than usual for the execution of their plans, they have only thereby facilitated the means of detection and proved their want of dexterity in such enterprises. While the hackneyed jobbers, managing their repeated impositions with less ostentation, are, in length of time, enabled to effect much greater mischief, as the mildew does more harm to the hopes of an honest husbandman than a thunderstorm. Of the sentence passed upon Lord Cochrane, I shall say little, but as the most offensive part of it is matter of feeling and of character connected with feeling, I think that the characters and feelings of those at whose expense the imposition was chiefly successful should have been likewise taken into consideration. If they are men immersed in habits of that nature, of which Lord Cochrane's offence only constituted a single act, I say that they had not a right to require, or to be gratified by, so severe a sentence as if they had come into court wholly unconnected with such proceedings in their own persons. What I have to demand, therefore, is whether the gentlemen of the Stock Exchange, with this notable example of punishment before their eyes, have any idea of adopting some new system, of forming some new resolution, against those usages which have hitherto prevailed among them, but have never till now, been visited by so tremendous a sentence. If they have not, I think it a pity that the learned judge, who passed the late sentence, did not endeavour to awaken their caution by some warning of the danger of persevering in those courses which had led, in the passing instance, to so calamitous a result. In short, an officer in the public service has fallen by conviction for conspiring with others to raise the funds. The public has therefore a right to expect from all those concerned with the sale of national property some general expression of their detestation of that offence of which Lord Cochrane has been convicted. Have they, or the major part of them, seemed by their general practice to consider it to be a crime till they came to suffer by it themselves from any alien to their profession? Then they raised clamours about it, no doubt. I ask farther whether the committee who advertised for evidence against Lord Cochrane mean to stop at the exposure of this signal offence, or whether they are resolved, as in justice they ought to be, to hunt out and eject from the stock exchange all time bargainers, hoaxers, bangers, and other practices of fraud for the raising or lowering of the funds, or if these are too powerful to be attacked, whether they mean, at least, simply to date a new era from Lord Cochrane's conviction, to proclaim an amnesty of the past, and to give notice that in future, hoaxing, banging, and everything that leads to the illegal practice of time bargaining, as well as time bargaining itself, shall be no longer practised among them with impunity. I call upon these gentlemen of the committee particularly to explain to the nation what, in their opinion, ought to be the future regulations of stock jobbing from this time, when a public example is to be made of one who, to say the worst of him, 
has only carried out the old practice to the utmost extent of its limits. I call, sir, upon the members of the Stock Exchange universally for an answer to these queries, founded upon facts of which none of them can deny the existence, and I further denounce prospectively against them that if they will make no rules for themselves, Parliament will interfere and either make some for them or will at least vivify the old ones by such means of discovery as themselves have used when they have been the dupes. In expectation of a reply, I remain, sir, etc., Bursa, to the editor of the Times. Reader's note, Appendix 18 ends. Appendix 19, The Champion, Sunday, July 3rd, 1814. The Pretensions of the Lawyers and the Sentence on Lord Cochrane. After referring to the pretension of lawyers to being held infallible, the article continues, quote, It has, we believe, been urged by the lawyers that as the verdict of a jury is to be considered the voice of the people, the latter can have no right to rejudge their own decisions, but the idleness of the plea is evident. It most frequently happens that the verdict of the jury is but a small part of the legal proceedings in any particular case. A jury may be so trammelled by technicalities imposed upon them in peremptory language, they may be so overpowered by a violent charge or so confused by a subtle one that their decision cannot in fairness be regarded but as the result of an overwhelming influence leaving them, at least, as they fancy, without an alternative, so that, after all, what have we but an emanation from an official quarter, tinctured with the interests, the prejudices, the passions, and the corruptions of a ministerial officer, in the natural existence of which the framers of our constitution believed, and the effects of which they desired to check by the healthy and unperverted sense of men who, being taken from the common conditions, were likely to be animated solely by feelings for the common advantage. But when the verdict of the jury, however it may be induced, is pronounced, can it be said that the most important part of the business is over? No, certainly not. The sentence is to come, which, in many of the most weighty cases, as affecting the welfare of society and the safety of persons, is left entirely to the discretion of the judge, so that here there is unbounded room for the exercise of his disposition, whatever it may be. If he be an ill-tempered and vindictive savage, and be, from political or personal motives, irritated against the unfortunate individual who is at his disposal, he may sentence him to a punishment which, as applied to the offence, shall outrage public feeling by its cruelty and public justice by a prostitution of its penalties to gratify private resentments. Has he ambitious views, which lead him to seek the favour of the court? He may, as the professed guardian of morals, do them the fatal injury by apologising, in the language of authority, and with all the imposing adjuncts of a dignified and grave station, for those crimes which, as practised by persons of the highest rank, have the most extensive influence in the way of example. There are mischiefs which, under the cover of legal proceedings, may be perpetrated on the country, and it is evident from their very nature that we can have no security against them but in the vigilance of the public's observation of whatever passes in the courts of law, and their firmness in expressing their opinion on its propriety. Secondly, experience fully supports this reasoning. English history shows that the worst enormities of abused power have been committed through the medium of the judges. To no other class of official persons is half the execration owing that is justly due to the lawyers for their frequent perversions of both law and justice in a base subserviency to the temporary feelings and purposes of guilty rulers. And be it remembered that the most abominable of their proceedings have had the sanction of a jury's verdict, procured by such means as have already been suggested, either by direct intimidation or by drawing close an artificial network of legal complications and restrictions which leave two jurymen about as much freedom of finding as he has of motion, who is placed with his face close to a wall and told to jump backwards or forwards, which he pleases. Thirdly, but perhaps the character and conduct of those who are at present judges are calculated to inspire an unlimited confidence in them, however distrustful of the profession and anxious as to its functions we have reason to be. This is, in some respects, a delicate inquiry, and indeed an almost unnecessary one for the vigilance of the people as to the discharge of public duties, should never be permitted to slumber through reposing on personal qualities. It is then only the arrogant and dictatorial tone of pretension held by the satellites of Westminster Hall 
that induces us to bestow a line on those of any of our present administrators of the laws we are told in the most fulsome terms that they are incorruptible that it is the boast of british justice to be clean-handed etc etc this boast as rested on a contempt of actual bribery need be no singular one in these days who now takes bribes from individuals no one we venture to affirm above the station of a customs house officer perhaps in no department of the public service could a pecuniary consideration for infidelity be more conveniently given and received than in the military a military man of inferior rank and slender hopes has often an opportunity of giving the most decided advantage to the enemy by acting traitorously and the reward would never be wanting yet whoever hears of such an act of baseness when was there ever an instance of it in the army why then should a lord chief justice with an income of twenty thousand pounds a year be highly complimented on a virtuous self-denial which he only shares with the subaltern who starves on four and sixpence a day his lordship's claims to peculiar confidence and honour must be of a rare kind to be valid he must represent to us in his behaviour the exalted attribute of justice simple impartial purified from passion partaking of the nature of a heavenly presidency rather than of power vested in a frail and feverish being liable to be misled by his interests and habits and every now and then to be carried away to the strangest lengths by a storm of anger if lord ellenborough aspires to deserve this the best praise that can be bestowed on one in his exalted station his ambition is of the proper kind but without meaning to convey any imputation against his integrity we must even take the liberty of telling him plainly what the public think that as yet he has by no means entitled himself to it his boisterous vulgarisms in the house of lords his impatient fretfulness with counsel particularly shown in cases where defendants may be supposed obnoxious to the palace or to himself personally the extraordinary views he takes of moral questions so favourable to certain princely profligacies and the unqualified terms of his charges in those trials that are calculated to rouse political feelings and partialities are circumstances that have made a strong impression on the public mind people therefore without indecently denying his honesty are much inclined to doubt his discretion and it must be admitted that his lordship's temper is not precisely of that poised and regulated kind which would be the best plea for an exemption in his favour from that popular superintendence and judgment of his conduct the exercise of which he finds so irksome and which his friends represent as so indecorous having thus vindicated the right of the people to express their sentiments freely on the conduct of the judges as on that of any other public men we shall shortly exercise it by joining in the general disapprobation which the sentence recently pronounced against lord cochrane has excited we never remember any sentiment to prevail more universally than this now does the firmest believers in his lordship's guilt are loud in their reprobation of that part of his punishment which includes the exposure of the person of a naval officer whose gallantry in the service of his country has been of the most devoted kind on a stage of infamy which is trodden by the miscreant whose crime is not to be named the public feeling has received a shock by this unexpected award from which it will not soon recover and surely it must be censured as highly indiscreet to have turned the horror that ought to have been engrossed by the crime entirely against the punishment with which it has been visited it is not our intention to enter at all on the question of lord cochrane's guilt or innocence it would be very wrong in every point of view to do this at present his lordship has signified his intention of defending himself before the house of commons and of explaining what he affirms are the misconceptions on which the verdict of the jury was founded the public will listen attentively to his second appeal but in the meantime we shall confine ourselves strictly to those circumstances which are sufficient to justify the general condemnation of the sentence passed on his lordship although the decision of the jury be confirmed in the first place admitting that the evidence may have been such as to compel a conviction yet there are evident features of extreme hardship in lord cochrane's situation when put on his trial and when brought up for judgment which enlist sympathy in his behalf and make it possible that matters of alleviation affecting his case only may have been concealed by the harsh formalities of the practice of the court the law concerning conspiracy is enough to make every individual tremble for his own safety through mistake or malice an innocent man may be included in one indictment with several guilty ones 
he is compelled to take his trial with them, the testimony that proves their crime raises a prejudice against him. It is almost conviction to him to have his name called over with theirs. The chain of evidence becomes complicated, and where a juryman to be found sufficiently clear-headed to mark exactly the connection between the facts sworn to and each of a dozen accused persons. If there is a hostile disposition towards the innocent individual existing in the breast of any in the court, who may have an opportunity of influencing the jury, how shall he escape being involved in the deserved fate of those with whom he has been confounded? If, after his conviction, he prepares himself with evidence suited to remove the misconceptions by which his guilt has been presumed, he is granted or denied the opportunity of bringing it forward according to the conduct of others, over whom he has no control, and who, in consequence of his innocence and their guilt, have an interest directly the reverse of his. Should they abscond, he is denied a new trial, although he presents himself fearlessly to meet the result. These are rules which Sir W. Garrow, the Attorney-General, calls the perfection of wisdom. To common understandings they seem the perfection of hardship. But what legal absurdity or cruelty that has given way to the growing intelligence of society has not been so eulogised and pertinaciously defended by the lawyers of the day. Lord Cochrane, it is clear, has been thus placed in a situation extremely disadvantageous to him as an accused person, and the public sentiment is roused in indignant alarm at the condemnation of an individual to the punishment of the pillory, a punishment more severe than that of death, to one in his lordship's situation of life, who complains in touching terms of hardships, which to common understandings involve palpable injustice, and which are of a nature to render any innocent person unable to establish his innocence. It would have been but prudent in the judge to have avoided raising this popular feeling against the sentence of the court, by keeping it more within the bounds of moderation. Its odious severity sets every one on scrutinising the soundness of the conviction, and the justice of the legal rules applied to his lordship's case. The further regards that influence the public to this strong commiseration of Lord Cochrane and disapprobation of his sentence are the unsuitableness of the latter for infliction on one of his lordship's condition, and, we had almost said, its ingratitude with reference to his very distinguished past services. It is very certain that justice may be as much violated by a disproportionate punishment as by the offence against which it is awarded. And when we consider that Lord Cochrane is one of the most esteemed officers of the Navy, that his courage is of the true Nelsonic kind, that he is a member of Parliament and a man of rank, the disgrace of the pillory to him must be deemed a thousand times worse than the mere infliction of death, for with this latter his lordship has been familiar. Now, without meaning to extenuate the crime of spreading false news to raise the public funds, we may say that the state of the general feeling and practice in the country does not, at present, warrant that a punishment worse than death shall be pronounced against him who, after the long forbearance of justice, is first convicted of this offence. Statesmen of high name and station are shrewdly suspected to gamble in the funds, and this practice also is illegal. Since such loose and improper feelings as to what is honourable prevail, it would have been but fair, at the first interference of the arm of the law, to have permitted it to fall more lightly. Lord Cochrane's politics are of a kind to excite the displeasure of the court against him. One of his relations has stirred in behalf of the Princess of Wales, and we believe he himself made or assisted some little scrutiny into Lord Ellenborough's prerequisites of office. These are considerations by which the Lord Chief Justice will indignantly disclaim being at all influenced, but we say that he ought to have been influenced by them, inasmuch as they rendered his situation towards the accused extremely delicate. Reader's Note, End of Appendix 19 Appendix 20 The Champion, a London Weekly Journal, Saturday, July 9th, 1814 The Case of Lord Cochrane Lord Cochrane's case is pregnant with the most weighty interests and most touching considerations. Every subject of this country who has access to a knowledge of the facts is bound, as a matter of positive duty, to investigate its merits, with a view to behaving afterwards, according to the means arising out of his condition, in the best way calculated to assist the vindication of what his conviction shall tell him to be justice, as it relates to the public and to the party. 
it contains the most forcible appeal to every one distinctly to bring his opinion to bear on it that the irresistible strength of the popular sentiment may either furnish to an injured person his remedy or solidly confirm the disputed decision of the tribunal which has adjudged him guilty of a serious offence on one side the common feelings of humanity as well as a regard for the national honour and the general welfare as composed of the safety of individuals are warmly excited that an innocent man should not be suffered to perish to sink down and be overwhelmed in the gulf of infamy and ruin in the sight of us all standing around him while he in vain cries to us for help and extends his arms to us for protection if lord cochrane shall be left by his countrymen to be sacrificed pursuant to his sentence and if there shall nevertheless appear to be good grounds for disbelieving his guilt we must blush for england considering the advantages which its people possess they would be more disgraced by the occurrence among them of a calamity of this kind than the french were by the murder of the callas family we had almost said than by the wholesale murders of the revolution which were committed by a few wretches possessed of power whose atrocities were stupidly submitted to by an ignorant and debased nation the judges and others officially concerned in convicting and punishing lord cochrane have not by any means their characters implicated in the correctness of these proceedings to the same degree that the national character is implicated in the conduct which its people shall now adopt between the parties a court during the judicial process which only lasts a few hours may be misled by some great error the administration of the law must be regulated by prescribed forms and these however generally useful will often become hardships in their application to particular cases the accused party may not be prepared with all the evidence bearing on his cause or may mar it by his injudicious conduct or his employed advocate may take a wrong view of what is for the interest of his client these possibilities should render us cautious in attributing an erroneous judgment and unmerited sentence to corrupt motives existing in the tribunal from whence they proceed but they also abundantly prove how much depends on holding no official decision whatever exempt from scrutiny we are astonished when we hear such a man as mr wilberforce declare that it is improperly disgracing a court of law to submit the correctness of its proceedings to public investigation that gentleman for whom we have the greatest respect is even averse to the interference of the house of commons to discharge such a duty although facts of acknowledged difficulty and of a nature to excite the keenest sympathy thrust themselves on the most superficial observation forcing doubt and therefore demanding deliberation this if we understand him right he does not deny but in their very teeth would acquiesce silently and impassively in what has been done lest as he says we should throw reproach on the administration of justice the purest among the pure the fairest among the fair and so forth does then mr wilberforce forget that not only is the house of commons legally competent to judge of every act of authority up to the very highest but that the real superiority of this country's political condition and the conscious feeling which we all have of the value of our constitution are to be traced to its exercise of this right what should we have been if this doctrine as to the indelicacy of scrutinising the conduct of public functionaries had been always adopted what enormities have been the consequence of its temporary prevalence then again how can it escape his acuteness that as no human institutional person is infallible none ought to claim or receive an exemption from a superintending cognizance farther admitting as he must when put to it that the courts may pronounce wrong judgments will he affirm that they will be more disgraced by having the injurious effects of these prevented by timely interference than by an acquiescence in the worst of all calamities and disgraces the punishment of innocence this is the point which is so unaccountably overlooked by those who take mr wilberforce's view of the question they think or at least by their arguments would seem to think that the correction of an error is more disgraceful to the party who is wrong than its perpetration they do not seem to understand that the most honourable thing that can be said of the institutions of any country is that as a whole they render it impossible that there should be any wrong without a redress 
an evil without a remedy, and that each of these institutions derives a respectability and strength from this general eulogium of a far more legitimate and lasting kind than can result from an impunity which tends to foster its worst errors and assist its progress towards destruction. We have said enough to show that, in our opinion, the House of Commons ought to have conducted for itself an inquiry into Lord Cochrane's case, more particularly when facts were laid before it which raised grave doubts of his lordship's guilt in the minds of some of its most respectable and impartial members. It is the object of this article to impress that it now devolves on the public, and more particularly on his lordship's constituents, the electors of Westminster, to investigate the whole business for themselves, by means of various documents and evidence, which they can command. Our readers must not look for these in our weekly sheet. We cannot, among our miscellany, furnish them, even with the correct outline of the proceedings of the court, the debates in the House of Commons, his lordship's defence, and the affidavits supporting it. Most of these, however, are to be procured, and justice, manliness, and humanity require that they should be attentively considered. We shall proceed to state and justify our own sentiments on this most interesting affair, as they have been influenced by the progressive information we have received. This will be expected of us, but we repeat, in a case like this, each ought to investigate and judge for himself. As we have hitherto rested our remarks on the possibility of Lord Cochrane's innocence, it is proper now to add that the voice of the public should now be raised in defence of their legal authorities and in reprobation of an indecent obstinacy of denial supported by falsehood wearing its most atrocious features should inquiry convince them of lord cochrane's guilt we are impelled to mention first that whether properly or improperly we previously cherished no particularly favourable opinion of lord cochrane as he was known to the public he always seemed to us more likely to throw discredit on the cause of honest politics by joining the word reform with hasty intemperate and undignified proceedings than to accomplish any real good by his efforts notwithstanding they were generally directed to the removal of what was wrong besides this we thought we observed about him too little selection in his companionships and too little of what is high-mindedly delicate in his conduct we heard of the charge brought against him by the stock exchange certainly with no disposition to turn from it as incredible on the contrary we leaned with the majority to the belief of his guilt through the weight of the accusation and a certain weakness arising chiefly from incoherency in his lordship's inconsiderately published defence the trial came on and by the reports of it in the newspapers our original belief was strengthened we saw no reason to doubt the propriety of the conviction we began indeed from what we heard and read to fancy that lord cochrane's guilt might be less heavy than that of the others who were included in the indictment we suspected that he might not have been made privy to the mysteries of the plot, although he might have culpably connived at what he knew to be going on, understanding that it would tend to his advantage, but not perfectly acquainted, nor seeking to be, with all the particulars. With this impression on our mind, we at the same time felt that Lord Cochrane had been exposed to various hardships and disadvantages in the course of the legal proceedings against him, and that these were sufficient to put even innocence in a very precarious situation on its trial in short to justify what an honourable member said in the house that he had need to be not only fully but fortunately guiltless who should escape conviction under such circumstances the being included in an indictment with a number of persons several of whom he had never seen by which the evidence and the jury's attention were confused and an odium was thrown on all the accused should the guilt of any be proved the refusal of the judge to attend the counsel when they prayed that the trial might be adjourned before they commenced the defence after a sitting of fifteen hours and when the jury were incapable of giving close thought to the statement the adjournment taking place immediately when the defence was concluded by which the prosecutors had given to them a great advantage in framing the reply the very fierce and unqualified terms of the judge's charge to the jury putting every fact in the strongest language against his lordship and laying little or no stress on the other side of the supposition all these things combined constituted as we thought a case of hardship of which the convicted party might reasonably complain the proceedings after the trial were more unequivocally severe the rule of the court under which lord cochrane was refused a new trial because others over whom he had no control did not appear with him to seek it 
was plainly inconsistent with justice as distinct from law, at least as it operated in this instance. It therefore shocked the public sense, and raised a strong feeling in favour of the aggrieved party. It is pleasing to find Mr. Ponsonby, who is not only an eminent lawyer, but one by no means to be suspected of a disaffected turn, declare that this rule is as little founded in law as in justice or reason, that it has, moreover, no ancient custom to plead in its behalf, but is a very novel introduction. We have some ground, then, for hoping that this piece of profound wisdom, as Sir W. Garrow luminously termed it, which every one accounts as senseless and cruel, and which is, besides an innovation, will shortly give place to a more liberal and useful and ancient form of practice. The facts contained in Lord Cochrane's defence, made personally in court when he was brought up to receive sentence, and which has since been published in its entire form, threw a new light on many important points of his case, and gave an explanation reconciling with his innocence several matters which served before to prove his guilt. This is a document which our reader should not fail to peruse. At last came the sentence, and in common with all the world we were astounded by it. It thunderstruck the prosecutors, who felt abashed and have petitioned against it. It amazed both sides of the House of Commons. It disgusted all persuasions of people, those who acquiesced in, as well as those who dissented from, the conviction. It seemed of most forgetful severity when Lord Cochrane's naval services were considered, of most injurious severity when his political conduct was looked at in connection with the happier fate of certain peculators and delinquents whose turpitude to the public had nothing to relieve its atrocity but their subserviency to the court in short the punishment awarded by the judge we allude to the pillory appears almost to every one overcharged as it relates to the crime unsuitable as it relates to the person convicted and unseemly as it relates to him who presided at the trial it is but fair to notice one exception by quoting from sir francis burdett's speech the sentence he thought cruel disgusting and severe beyond all example the noble lord who was the object of it was the only person he had met with who was not of this opinion his lordship when he sir f burdett visited him in the king's bench prison said that he had not to complain of his sentence but of his conviction were he guilty the whole of his punishment and more than the whole was justly due to him End quote. We come now to the proceedings in the House of Commons. His Lordship's defence there ought certainly, in some way or other, to be got before the public, with his feelings highly strung and irritated, as it would seem, in an extraordinary degree. It contained passages reflecting on the conduct of Lord Ellenborough, which the newspaper reporters were told in plain terms they would publish at their peril. Lord Cochrane evidently delivered himself under the almost maddening consciousness of having been the victim of gross injustice, some of his accusations pronounced with great bitterness, it may be found necessary to keep back, but the narrative and argumentation part of his statement should certainly be printed. It had a prodigious effect on those who heard him. Several of the most impartial and steady members declared that in their view it established that there had been on the trial a misdirection of the jury by the judge of a most material nature, and to the prejudice of his lordship as one of the accused. They added that, on the facts which every one thought told most against his lordship, he had shed a totally new light, either by offering to rebut them with testimony that deserved attentive consideration, or by explaining circumstances which altered their import, or by showing with much simplicity and indication of general feeling how they had been misconceived, and to what unlucky accidents it was owing that they operated to his prejudice. Persons whose respectability and judgment will not be impeached, from either side of the house, protested that under the weight of what they had heard, they could not sleep on their pillows were they to vote for Lord Cochrane's expulsion without further inquiry. Many affirmed that the case had always appeared to them doubtful, and that now their doubts had become the most serious kind. A gentleman who interrupted his lordship in the course of his animadversions on the Chief Justice avowed that however injudicious and unfounded these circumstances were, he could not shut up his opinion from facts so strong as those contained in the defence, nor could he reconcile it to his conscience to add confirmation to a verdict of the soundness of which he saw reason to doubt, and bitterness to a fate which it was more than possible might be undeserved. Yet the House voted the expulsion of Lord Cochrane, not, however, without a division. Forty-four were for further inquiry, and a hundred and forty for expulsion. 
on the face of this proceeding it appears that forty-four intelligent and honest men think that there is at least a strong call for further investigation yet lord cochrane has been sentenced to the pillory but if we read the speeches of the members we shall find it by no means follows that the hundred and forty-four who decided for expulsion are satisfied as to his lordship's guilt mr wilberforce for instance speaks of the case as very distressing and as very painful to his feelings but adds that he deemed it his duty to bow to the decision of the judge and jury now this is not an exercise but a surrender of judgment and indeed we may infer that mr wilberforce attaches at least doubt to the case for otherwise he would not regard it as distressing but rather as one in which the offender had deprived himself of every claim to compassion by shameless obstinacy and abandoned perjury it is observable that the propriety of expulsion was almost invariably rested on the propriety of supporting the court of law and on the many inconveniences which as it was truly enough said would attend a reinvestigation of the proceedings the reader sees that these considerations have no connection with lord cochrane's guilt or innocence yet judging from the temper and sentiment manifested by the house we are inclined to believe that it was these which chiefly produced its decision and that a very large proportion of the majority are far from satisfied in their minds that their late associate has been properly convicted for ourselves we have no hesitation to say after a most impartial study of the various documents that our opinion is changed and that from thinking the weight of evidence on the side of lord cochrane's guilt we now think it on the side of his innocence this at least is incontestable that great difficulties were imposed upon him by legal forms that the most important facts were misrepresented to his prejudice on his trial and that if the charge of the judge was adopted by the jury as clue to their decision they have been misguided the best statement of lord cochrane's defence that we have seen was in the morning herald the reports in the times and chronicle gave no idea of it but we suppose it will speedily be published in a more perfect form than any in which it has yet appeared it makes perfectly clear that the chief justice's most important assertion to the jury that lord cochrane received de beringer quote, in the costume of his crime end quote, is utterly unsupported by any evidence given on the trial and that it is in contradiction to several strong probabilities it directs attention to the singular fact that lord ellenborough in some instances quoted lord cochrane's voluntary affidavit for proof against him and in others denied it all authority and truth it does all but prove that de beringer's dress when he came in the hackney coach to lord cochrane's house was falsely described by the coachman and it convicts this witness of other falsehoods while it justifies a belief that he may have been actuated by a corrupt desire for the reward by showing that he is a convicted ruffian of the vilest kind it satisfactorily accounts for the non-examination of lord cochrane's servants by counsel on the trial for whose examination his lordship pressed by note when the proceedings were going on who would have proved that de beringer's dress was not of a kind to excite suspicions in any breast it makes very manifest that lord cochrane has suffered by being joined with others whose guilt must be presumed conscious of his own innocence and therefore believing theirs he left to them the trouble of arranging the defence to the indictment and neither his wishes nor his interests seem to have been consulted it establishes that he had no connection with de beringer's defence and gives reason to believe that he was but little acquainted with his person it tenders fresh testimony on the oaths of five respectable witnesses as to the manner in which lord cochrane's bank notes found their way into de beringer's hands in fine it mentions a multiplicity of circumstances furnishing presumption of innocence and makes it indubitable that the case might have had much assistance of which it has been from one cause or another deprived signed ed reader's note newspaper extract ends letter begins reader's note ends i have only selected such opinions of the press as may serve to elucidate what has been advanced were i to collect public opinion as expressed at the time such collection would far more than exceed this volume in bulk if necessary for my fuller defence it must yet be adduced should my life be spared that my days have been thus far prolonged is under providence to be attributed to the skill of my physician dr bence jones and to the unremitting care and attention of my constant medical attendant mr henry lee of savile row dundonald End of Appendix 20. 
Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. End of Autobiography of a Seaman, Volume 2 by Lord Thomas Cochrane.